we are live. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Grasshopper's Fireside Chat, How to Scale Your Business from One to Many. Today's chat is going to cover how to take your small business or startup to the next level. My name is Mary Mallard. I'm the Social Media and Community Manager here at Grasshopper, and I will be your host today. So when you're a small business owner and entrepreneur, growth is really exciting, but it's also a challenge. There's a lot of growing pains that come with growing your business. You have to worry about hiring people, finding funding for your business, marketing your business. Well, today we have a bunch of panelists that are here to help you succeed with all of these challenges. It doesn't matter what kind of business you have, you can definitely get some great takeaways from this chat. Um, let me take a minute just to introduce our panelists. We have Bhavin Parikh, co-founder and CEO of Magoosh, David Waring, editor-in-chief of FitSmallBusiness.com, Anita Campbell, CEO and publisher of SmallBizTrends.com, Rod Woodcock, president of the alternative board Fraser Valley, and David Cicerelli, founder and CEO of Voices.com. So just to take a second to go over the format of the chat, we have... Um, created these questions based on feedback that we've gotten from all of you out there about what you want answered about growing your business. So we're going to be taking four, about 45 minutes to ask those questions. We will have 15 minutes at the end of the chat reserved for your questions. So if you have any questions that you'd like to ask, you can tweet us at Grasshopper using the hashtag FRSDChat, or you can use the little chat box that's on this page to email us a question. We'd like to give a shout out to our sponsors. Thank you so much for helping us put on this chat. You can see all their logos at the bottom of the page if you'd like more information about them. And at the very end of the chat, we will be presenting you with a survey. If you could just take a few minutes to take that just so that we can uh, make sure that we're continuing to improve our fireside chats and bring you the best content that we can. All right, without further ado, let's hop right into the questions. So I'm going to throw our first question out there. What are the most common mistakes you see entrepreneurs make in creating business goals? Well, I'll get things going there. Um, this is David from Voices. One of the things that I see in working with other entrepreneurs is that they actually don't bother to even write down their goals. So oftentimes it's these ideas that you might have in your head about where you want to be maybe um, you know, a year, two, three years out, or maybe some really big idea, kind of long-term visions, but without actually putting them down on paper, or even better yet, um, typing them up and creating more of a living document um, that can sit right on your desktop, uh, that you update even every quarter or at least once a year, um, I think that's probably the first gap, and it's a practice that um, I've been doing myself for the last 10 years, is actually maintaining um, a living document and an annual business plan that for the most part a lot of it stays the same but at least I can articulate um, the annual goals and then I actually I go as far as breaking them down into quarterly monthly and even daily targets so I can kind of check okay if I'm if I'm hitting the daily goal then I know ultimately um, this will lead to reaching these annual targets so I think the biggest mistake is not bothering to write them down in the first place you know, just just uh, on that point, see, he makes a great uh, a, a great point there. People don't write them down. I find even when they are written down, if we do get uh, a business owner that has that business plan, they often um, are, are a little aggressive and they overestimate their success in the 12 to 24 month period, especially the startup. And they can put themselves behind the eight ball right out of the gate. Uh, they don't allow a, a proper time of having enough capital to get things off the ground keeping the short-term goals um, at achievable and attainable. Uh, they start out with the almost best case scenarios projecting through. So um, I think they, you know, they, they overstate their success. That's one of the biggest challenges a new entre an entrepreneur has in creating a business goal is to rein it back and make it realistic and, uh, and control it. So one thing that's worked well for us on that note is we have an annual plan and we review it every six months to create a new annual plan. So we see how we're doing against the annual plan and if we were too aggressive um, or weren't aggressive enough, we then review it. So like uh, David said, it's a living document, um, but you want to re renew your plans well before they are due or expire. Uh, and then the second piece there is we try to make them very measurable and say, we're trying to hit X million in revenue or a certain net promoter score rather than creating projects because it's unclear whether or not the projects will actually tie to the metrics that make your business succeed. 
So putting those metrics in place in terms of your plan will and your goals will make you more successful uh, rather than just saying, I'm going to work on this project, which may or may not contribute to your business growth. Yeah. Excellent point. So let me add this. Uh, I would say one of the key issues I see is not making your goals specific enough for revenue broken down according to like daily and weekly goals at least. When you're talking about revenue, you have to know what you can realistically bring in and how long it's going to take you to bring that revenue in. And unless you break it down into that kind of detail, you're bound to miss those. So be very, very specific, particularly on the revenue goal side. Yeah, I think the other panelists have it pretty much covered there, so I'll just reiterate. Um, I see a lot of the same things, not making um, your goals measurable in some way and then not breaking it down into you know bite-sized chunks and making sure that everything you do on a daily, weekly, monthly basis ties into your longer-term goals. Awesome, yeah, it looks like we're all in agreement about that. Write your goals down, make them bite-size. Um, all right, so our next question deals a little bit with hiring. Um, when you hire your first employee, do you think it's a good idea to offer them a stake in the company as part of their compensation, or is that something that you should avoid right out of the gate? You know, um, uh, Rod Woodcock here from the Alternative Board, I, I had that great opportunity to sit down on a monthly basis with uh, over 20 business owners uh, on our boards, and, and just the two boards, and it's the, there's an often, often strong discussion about bringing on the partners and how early on and, and this sort of thing. Um, I'm going to say a, a, a strong statement to the no up front. I believe you need to have time. I mean, if it's a, you need to have time to create a relationship, understand, have an alignment with uh, making sure that the, you know what you think success is, what they think success is, and, the, and there's total alignment. Um, there's always an opportunity to create some sort of compensation with shares and, and bring in that vested interest and that ability to motivate people. But more often than not, I've seen business owners regret doing that early on. Uh, timelines are, are, you know, it's a matter of perspective. Is it three months, six months, or two years? But you need to, in a smaller company starting up, you need to create a relationship and understand, and you need to be in control. You need to be able to move the direction you want. So I'm, I'm pretty firm on the, on the no side on that. I'll, I'll also reiterate on the, or agree on the no side on that, and I think you know you don't have a lot of clarity. You know, at, at the first, you know, when you're bringing on your first employee, it's very early on in the business's life, and you know, one percent may end up being worth a ton, it may end up being worth nothing, and and either you or the employee has, uh, neither you or the employee has any good insight into what that may look like. So it's it's just too early in the process. People get the wrong expectations also, your employees. They expect to get recompensated very quickly, almost invariably. And what most people don't anticipate is how long it's actually going to take to get a business off the ground and actually generate real return for that equity stake. And so you'll spend all this time, you'll get your people up to speed, only to find they're very disappointed. They have expenses. They need to get paid for the most part. And, and then where are you going to be? You will basically have given free training to someone, and you'll be left out. You know, pay people. Find a way to pay people, and that's the way to go at first. So, so I'll be uh, the other point of view. Um, I, I mean, I think I agree in terms of when you're building, bringing on a business partner or someone you're giving a significant equity stake to, say no up front, make sure there's alignment. Um, but all of our employees do have a stake in the company. We structure it as options. And I try to be as transparent as possible when, you, when I do give equity that uh, it may not turn into real cash for a long time. And you should think of it as a bonus, and it's usually... You know, on the order of magnitude for early, early employees, maybe a few percent, and less than a percent, or tenths of a percent for later employees. And we create a vesting period. So they don't earn anything until they've worked at the company for a year and transparent about that. And then they earn it over a period of four years in aggregate. And so that way, um, if people end up not sticking around or there are issues, uh, they don't end up with a stake in the company. But then those who do have stuck around, uh, who haven't left, they feel like they're part owners in the company, and it builds great alignment and motivation. So that's at least uh, my perspective. 
there are other ways to encourage employees to feel like they have a stake uh, in the success of the company. Um, you can in introduce, instead of a stock employee stock ownership program uh, or plan, you can have an employee uh, profit sharing plan. So if the company is uh, generating cash and profits even in the first, you know, in the first year, um, you can share a percentage of those profits equally amongst all employees, which is what we do. So that way, it's not you're not getting into the legalities of ownership and and uh, potentially long-term vesting. But when things go well, you can all celebrate together, and it's. We found that that to be a little bit more equitable from the sense that there are people in particular roles, for example, finance or customer service, that don't necessarily have um, the ability to generate a commission or some other kind of bonus. Whereas knowing that when we cut expenses or every new person that we're bringing on board or new project, it has to be aligned to those revenue targets. And so with that, um, that people start to realize, well, you know, if you're in finance, accounts receivable really matters. Keeping those numbers down and getting fast kind of collections generates cash. Um, you know, we're not letting that go sour. That you know, eat the profits. So basically, having everyone focused on profits and profitability, uh, and then sharing in that, um, you know, is is what we found working. The, the caveat on that is that you do need to disclose whether you're profitable or not and how profitable. So depending on kind of the nature or the type of entrepreneur, if you want to keep everything to yourself and, and, and uh, in terms of the information, then that might not be such a, uh, such a good plan. But if you're willing to disclose the speed of your company uh, and uh, instead of giving away shares in your company, that a profit sharing plan might be an alternative for you. You know, it, it, it's a great point. And just to go back to the first question, um, as much as I strongly say no, it, it begs other questions. Mm -hmm. And I think it comes back to the business plan. Uh, long as it's you know, not a knee-jerk reaction, but it, it depends how you structure the company, what type of share structure you have. A lot of other questions can take place. I mean, generally, I'll, st I'll stick to the no, but the reality, some great points on profit sharing and, and, and on stock options. But it's back to that planning concept. Um, I find that, that when it's when I've seen it taking place, it's been reactionary, maybe to keep a key employee. When the reality was, it should have been laid out in the business plan from day one. Here's the structure. Here's how it's going to take place. Here's why it's going to take place. Voting, non-voting, all those conversations. So um, uh, I'll just leave the comment at that. That you know, there's a place for everything if it's properly planned from the beginning. But it's certainly nothing to react with. Because that's when you start to run into troubles and make the decisions for the wrong reasons at the wrong times. Great. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of information there to consider when you're thinking about compensating your employees. Um, so the next question covers a little bit about roles in your company. How do you determine what roles to outsource in your company and what roles should you keep internally? Um, we've just gone through that process, so I'll, I'll lead off here. Um, when we originally started our site, um, we thought that we would be able to outsource our writing and our content uh, because there's so many writers that are out there uh, looking for work. Uh, but what we actually found was it's very difficult to uh, find writers that produce high quality content and it's so core to our business um, that we couldn't sacrifice there. So we kind of did a 180 and went from using, you know, 100% outsource writers to hiring our own uh, full-time writers in-house. Um, so I think you have to really figure out what your core value proposition is and make sure that that's the people, you, the people that are doing that work uh, you hire internally. Other things like bookkeeping, um, you know, for us, some of the paid advertising stuff that we do is not very core to our business, so we're able to outsource that. You know, if I, if I can add, it's interesting, we uh, automatically think outsourcing has uh, taken a position and bringing someone in to do it. Um, we found just recently, for example, we, we have um, at our boards, we brought an HR specialist, a contract specialist in, and it's, it's not that there was ever going to be an HR person to outsource, it's just we find a lot of small companies, especially one, three, five, ten employees. They're not, they're not doing what they need to do, for example, to be even on-site on a legal standpoint with human resources, hiring, firing procedures, job descriptions. So they're looking and they actually bring expertise in. So they look to outsource something that didn't even exist. It's not to take something that did exist and take it outside. It's to say, let's have that come in. 
often we'll see the bookkeeper. Um, we make light of that, but a small company and the, and the owner's doing everything. And they'll say, you know, let's bring an expert in six hours a week to take care of it. So I think the opportunity on outsourcing is to take specialties. I won't say they're non revenue generating, but to, to his point, they're not core. They're ancillary. They're around the outside, but often that entrepreneur and that small business owner, that privately held business, they don't go out and do those things to begin with. So the real opportunity I see for outsourcing is to do more than you would normally do and go above and beyond, but do it in a contracted specific way and then stick to your core business until you can expand and bring a full time person in. Another way to think about outsourcing is uh, not not to make again light of the situation, but is it something that you as an entrepreneur enjoy doing, or is it something you can't stand? Yeah, kind of just you know the the fork in the road. Well, if I really loved designing graphics and PowerPoint presentations and creating marketing collateral, you know, even though I might be you know have an e-commerce site as an example, but I really love the design and I, it, it drives me, then you know consider continuing doing that until. But if there's other stuff that you just you know, dread doing, um, then that's pretty much an easy decision of, of uh, something that might not be suitable to kind of uh, you continue to do personally, uh, or uh, you know, and then you can decide do you want to still do it in house or not. But sometimes it, it comes to you as a, a solo entrepreneur deciding should I hire somebody or just simply you know, outsource to a, um, a specialist, if you will. And then the other um, thought. Is, uh, and really question to ask yourself, is, is this a role or is it more of a project? Because oftentimes people hire for a project, as an example, building a website or building a mobile app, and you know they, they, they think it's a whole role, but it's actually just a kind of a task that needs to be done or a project with a start and an end date. Those are not good you know, uh, um, positions to be hiring in on a full-time basis. Because now you've committed to it. Unless you, I mean, pretty low to, to go into hiring somebody full time, knowing full well that once this project's done, you're letting them go. Of course, unless you disclose that to them. But um, ask yourself: Is this a project, or is this a full time role that I can see one, two, three, four, five years down the road that we still need to be doing this kind of work? You know, the the, the writing of articles would be a great example. That's part of the business. We're doing it for the long term. And yeah, bring it in house, um, develop those skill sets, the process internally. If it only has a short term window, then I, I think that's probably another um, good type of role uh, that is better served outside the core of the company. Anyone else with thoughts? Yeah, I think the other the other panelists covered it quite well, which is uh, don't outsource the core value to your business. Use outsourcing for expertise that you might not have. Finance is a, accounting is a great example. We have an external CFO who outsourced who works for other companies as well. Um, HR is another good example. And then the one thing I'll add is, is that for core work, we sometimes outsource it after we have a really, really good understanding of what it is, having done it for a few years, and then recognizing we can gain some support and scale by outsourcing it but managing sort of managing that component in house and almost training that that person up. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Good answers everyone. Um, so last question about hiring employees. So I'm a small business owner. I have maybe one or two people and I feel like I'm ready to bump my team up to five or ten. What are some signs that it's not the right time in my business life cycle to hire more employees? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off again. Um, you made a comment there's one or two and going to five or ten. I, I look at it as every single employee and in the privately held business, that small business owner, it can make or break one hire at a time bringing on key people. I believe in something, I won't get into it, called benchmarking, understanding the job. If the job could talk, what would it say? How do you look at those things prior to bringing on an individual? And um, I think in our boards when we've had those discussions, inevitably the, the comment is, is everyone working at 110% capacity? Assuming it's not a uniquely different role, but often in a smaller company, everyone's doing two or three or four roles, and 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 most often it's that that entrepreneur, the CEO, the president needs to step back and start 
saying, I did, I've done eight things. What do I like to do as a core? What am I best at? Let's start taking this and creating an individual to do that role to allow me to spend more time at what I do best, whatever that may be. And I think once everyone's kind of maxed and you realize you've been running at over 100% capacity for a while, then that, that's the time you can start bringing on one person. And I, th I look at bringing on every individual. I mean, you know, if you're bringing on a $50,000 a year position or whatever that happens to be and you're running a $500,000 million or $2 million company, you've got to be able to gen generate net revenue to cover that off. You don't have to directly connect it saying, will they create money? They may create freedom that allows me to go generate greater revenue. But it's, it's very important. It's very, very important that you look at it at, on an individual one-at-a-time basis and make sure that everybody's uh, at full capacity for an extended period of time and then make that strategic decision. Another issue to look at is whether your revenue sources are secure or whether they are still very uncertain. I'm actually a big believer in bringing on uh, outsource people, um, project people, uh, independent workers at first until you get a real sense that your revenue is here to stay because it's a very painful thing to bring employees on and then have to lay them off at some point. So you just want to be sure you've got that money that you know that it's likely to continue. There are no guarantees of anything and nobody's ever going to be a hundred percent sure but just try to be as sure as you can and it's a low risk way to bring in someone to add to some extra capability by bringing in an independent worker once you bring them in and as you see that you're starting to be able to deliver more and that revenue is growing and that it's likely to continue growing that's when you want to start bringing people on and I totally agree with the idea of, you know you have to understand the job if you don't understand what it is the job is supposed to be doing and what you want in that job that's a recipe for disaster I mean that is that is going to lead to nothing good later on and bring them on one by one I, I agree with uh, bringing somebody All bringing businesses aren't able to bring on lots at once it's so you know there's there's a lot of you know reasoning that people think and kind of self-justify of why I'm gonna bring on three, four, five people at once because, oh, it'll make training easier and I can, you know, recruit once and, hey, I'm doing these interviews anyway. Um, I might as well hire four people at the same time. Well, um, it's a terrible idea um, because, first of all, it, you don't realize the amount of post-hire training that you have to do. I, I think that's often underestimated. Um, but, you know, the, the, Rod made a great point about your existing team, whether it's three people going to four, I mean, that, that's... You know, you're you're adding you know 25% more capacity to your company. Um, that's you know that's a lot of extra capacity. You have you know the revenue to support to support that, um, and everyone should be basically kicking and screaming, going, "I am, yeah, I got so much work, I cannot keep up." Um, one of the things that we you know we we have you know various kind of daily metrics that would be indicative of that. So for example, a customer satisfaction score. If that starts to drip, dip down for a prolonged period of time, when you drill into that, well, the reason is because we can't get back to customers fast enough. We're always dealing with the treading water. Well, maybe that's, maybe that's fine. Um, there's other, you know, other indicators um, that might be uh, telling that it's the right time. So I think you can use People verbally will, you know, sometimes will say, oh, yeah, we need, we need somebody else right now. Let's hire two people because I think we've got the workload. Um, you need to know for yourself as the entrepreneur that it's the right time. You can take their insight, um, but you can back it up with data. And, you know, really everyone should be thinking, going, this is way overdue. Then you know it's the right time. You know, just to just add that, David made a great point, and it's that kicking and screaming. And, and often we look at bringing on, again, not, not to... I, I, um, thought I, I thought I saw you smile at that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, it's so true. And, it, and, and I can suggest, and I've seen it happen so often, to kind of get outside the box. And when we're looking to bring on a new individual into a company, I, I, not to say the lowest common denominator, but often we see people starting to take their three or four role position and, and let go of one thing. 
and then go, now they're focusing more on the two things they're very good at, or you realize they're very good at after they've been working with you. So you'll you'll look around and say, oh, isn't that interesting? You know what? If we had th a person that came in that did nothing but grab this and this and this from these three people, they'd all be released another 25, 30% capacity because they all hate doing this. And sometimes, uh, you know, it's it's possibly in a, in a, not retail, but in a storefront operation, it's it's the front end of, of working on phones. Sometimes it's the bookkeeping. Sometimes it's it's technical in the background. Often even, say, social media, bring on a specialist or a contract. But it's, the key is when they're kicking and screaming, is to say, okay, what's the common denominator, and what individual could you bring in at the possibly a lower comp that will, will relieve that work and let them rise up and really do they do well, as opposed to just saying, here's the next role. And sometimes the role we bring someone on for, we don't even know it exists in the company. We don't even have a name for it. We just realize that when we've talked to our employees, this thing needs to be done by one person, and it will relieve them all. Hopefully that was clear. Mary, one other thing I just want to add as well, too, um, which sometimes it is a consolidation of uh, multiple roles held, as, as Rod says, by a variety of people. But I wanted to add, you know, to answer your question, what are some of the signs that it's not the right time? I would say if you as an entrepreneur, especially in the early days, if you as an entrepreneur have not done the role yourself, it is terrible to go you know, at least in a very preliminary way, so that you have an understanding of what you're ultimately hiring for. Um, you know, a great, you know, an example would be, you know, that, that's why it's easy to say, okay, I've done the bookkeeping, I know enough of it to be dangerous, I'm not doing it well, uh, or I've maintained my website because I, you know, you know I, I, I can kind of do it, but it's not well. Um, but at least if you, you get, you have some exposure to it, you know when it is done well, how to spot it. And I think you know that that's something else I would add is you know I wouldn't I wouldn't jump into a position that you don't have some exposure or some idea of how to do it and, and what success looks like. Yeah, great. Those are all that's all great advice. Um, so now we're going to move into a lot of people's favorite topic: financing your small business. Um, so our first question here is: How do you decide how much you should pay yourself as a small business owner? So I can kick this off. Um, the advice, the, uh, what I did and the advice I give others is to just pay yourself as little uh, as you need to, to focus on the business and cover your expenses. Because basically early on there's just such a high probability that your business won't succeed and any money you take out of the business is money that you're not investing in growth or continuing to run the business. And so I firmly believe that early on take just what you need and in some cases if you have savings you might not take anything out but take what you need to, to live in a way where you can focus on the business without worrying about your core expenses but uh, not much more than that. The, the, the bankers and financiers will love that statement um, and it's true. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. I just I had a, a mute button come on. Um, it is true. I think um, ever take as little as possible um, I think on a, on a bit of a longer term basis, depending on when we say like uh, at startup, how much should you pay? Um, you don't need to be competitive in the marketplace, but I see too many business owners start to take out larger amounts of money, and it you know it takes away from profitability of the company. On the other side of the coin, it needs to be somewhat competitive so you can say, is it generating money? Is it generating uh, net revenue? But uh, I I wholeheartedly agree. You want to keep it pretty thin. You know, pay your bills and worry about growing the business and reinvest the capital. So I'm going to be a little contrarian in this sense that at first I don't even think you have a choice if you're bootstrapping. So if you're bootstrapping, you probably don't have any money to pay yourself. So just assume that you're not going to be able to pay yourself for some period of time, whether that's six months, a year, whatever. Now, the other Part of this, though, is to remember that you're going to have to force yourself to pay yourself some money at some point if you're bootstrapping. Because what that will do is that's going to give you the boost, the impetus to actually earn more in your business. You can't keep saying, oh, well, I'm just building for the future. I'm going to keep building, you know, because three, four years into it, you still have a life to live. And at some point, you have to say, 
okay, I invested everything, I put it back into the business, I didn't take anything at first, but now I've just got to set myself some kind of salary, even if it's 20000 a year, but something. And I'm going to make sure that I make that kind of money and whatever I do, I'm just going to go and set out to do it because I'm a big believer in goals. And if we set goals, we have a tendency to achieve goals. If we don't set goals, we'll just drift. And, and then we're not getting paid what we should be getting paid. We have to remember we're in this to, you know, we're, we're in this to make money along with other things. We're there to serve customers. We want to deliver back to our communities. We want to um, help our employees, but, you know, it also starts at home, and we have to help ourselves. I'm going to agree wholeheartedly with that. I think that's a great point, and we've actually just gone through that as well. My business partner is independently wealthy, and so he, he, even though we've been doing the business for a year and a half now, doesn't need to pay himself a salary. Um, but we made the decision that he needs to start taking um, maybe not a market-based uh, salary, but a livable, a livable wage. Um, out of the business because <clears throat> it's not really a real business and he's in essence subsidizing the business uh, until you know everyone that works for the business is taking a salary and that's you know that helps you there's nothing that helps you with goal setting and those types of things more than okay this is how much money we have on the table to spend and that type of thing yeah. I think it also with with the that independent business owner um, you, need, you need to stand up and make sure you're running a true business and not just creating a job for yourself, and I'm sure we'll cover that a little bit later on. But it may be, as you said, not market-based pay, but eventually you do need to start getting that uh, that compensation up there. Uh, if you're looking at uh, you know going out and getting financing through other sources, they're going to look at that as a be competitive. Not suggesting that you're building the instantaneously to sell the business. But the reality of all there's longer the longer the track record shows that the company is able to pay out a competitive wage to the person who's running it the better it looks for the business on the books. Start to set that precedent. Are you truly profitable or are you just showing profit as a company because you're paying no, no wages out to the owner? And that's a fallacy. Yeah, I'd agree that as soon as you find, I think I mean, I said it well, I mean the reality is in the earliest stage you may not be able to three, six months um, just as you can get lift off, but as soon as humanly possible, um, pay yourself, yourself something. I think uh, when we started 10 years ago, I think we paid ourselves it's Something like five or five hundred dollars a month, or a thousand dollars a month, just something. To, and and the goal was not that that was that wasn't the end goal. It was every month, you know, every six months, we kind of revisit. Hey, can we can we increase this? Um, the other thing that it did once it was up to something reasonable. When we hired the first couple of employees, I remember this because I can tell a quick story. That there was a point where there was um, an employee who obviously no longer with us now, but was very distracted, very unproductive, to the point where um, Stephanie, my wife, and I were actually withholding our, from cashing our own paychecks. We literally ran roasties. And they would just sit on the kitchen counter waiting for everyone else to cash their paycheck. And we were like, this is, until we literally had like two, three weeks uh, or two, three payroll runs worth of this. And like, this is crazy. Why are we keeping like this one fellow, an unproductive employee who really doesn't care, and just going to pick up the paycheck when we can't even cash our own? And so that sense of, yeah, I say I'm getting a paycheck, but I'm not even catching it. Cashing it was such a pain point for us. That was a point of that we never wanted to go back to again. And so I think when you have, you know, by by going down that road of starting to pay yourself, you'll really feel the pain when something isn't going well. And you are treating it like a business instead of a hobby that might make some money on the side. Well said. Awesome. Great. Yeah, those are all great answers. Um, all right. Next question concerning funding. Mm -hmm. um, crowdfunding is really gaining momentum. A lot of people are really interested in it. Um, when should you consider a non-traditional form of fundraising for your business, like a Kickstarter or an incubator, instead of small business loans or investors or VC funding? I, I think if it, you know, this is one of those things where if you you know if you read the news, you would think that like every business out there, you know, is crowdfunding their business now, um, and that you know this is still you know such a small slice of you know small business financing for startups. Uh, I think it's only appropriate for very, very specific types of, of products. Um, 
you know, and, and certainly not most services. Um, so, you know, I, I wouldn't look to crowdfunding. The, the, one, the one area where I would look to crowdfunding is if I had some sort of consumer product, and I would actually look at it more as sort of like a testing the market to see if you could generate interest, you know, in your Kickstarter or whatever it is, because that would be a good indication that, hey, maybe people will buy this. But even after that, I would probably look elsewhere for startup financing. You know, I think that's a great comment. I was involved uh, on a consulting basis with a firm about three years ago, put out um, some, a great small piece of furniture, had some great exposure through Wired Magazine and elsewhere, and they went the crowdfunding route, and it was relatively successful, far more successful um, on a marketing standpoint, almost as a marketing plan, as an advertising plan, than, than actually on the capital funding side of the coin. So I think that's a very strong statement. And it's misleading to the vast majority of entrepreneurs and business owners that start things up out there. Um, you know, not necessarily all the online side of things, but the, the not bricks and mortars retail. But when you're out hiring and service-based companies, it's it's really you know it doesn't exist. That option doesn't. Uh, it's it's a very fine point to the to what you said, um, David. It's it's that hits the news. It looks good, and people think it's. But when they get right into it, it's it's not viable. And they need to look at, at traditional methods and, and get down to the basics of, of, you know, what is the profit margin? What's it going to look like? You know, ask the basic questions. I'm always surprised how many business owners I sit down and I say, so what's your net profit margin? And they can't answer the question. They, they, they don't have a clue. And, and yet they're running a decent business. And I said, well, maybe we should just look at the numbers of, of what you actually think your net profit's going to be. You know, what's your gross margin? Just very basics that you put in place and those things start to, when you're doing your planning, start to drive the fact of where you're going to get your funding. Crowdfunding is a great, very exciting source, but the reality of it is it's going to mislead a lot of people that need to prove the numbers when they go to get financing and actually say, hey, I can make a profit. Here's what it is. And I can move from 6% net profit to 8, which is a massive move. And yet people think, no, I'm going to make 30%. Yeah, it's not, it's not going to happen. Uh, it's a passion of mine. I'll, I'll back off it for a moment. <laughs> I, I think crowdfunding is as much about marketing as it is about getting money. Uh, the most successful people at crowdfunding, the most successful businesses at crowdfunding, are the ones who really market their product, their project very, very well. And you have to really think of it as more of a marketing opportunity. It's a way to get things out there because uh, you know a lot of a lot of the press will write about these projects. I mean, it gives you an opportunity to galvanize your followers. So I would say, you know, don't think of crowdfunding so much as a source of money, but more as a, a marketing opportunity. And instead, you have to go with the tried and true methods of funding out there. And for the vast majority of entrepreneurs, that's going to be personal savings. It may, might be loans from family and friends. Um, it's going to be credit cards. A lot of people finance their businesses on credit cards and knock on wood, the, the ones who are lucky and successful manage not to get totally underwater when they do that. And then of course getting loans at some point. And we've always tried to, um, you know, also um, Mary, you brought up about um, venture capital as well, too. Um, again, this is one of those forms of funding that's very headline-driven in the news, but the fact is it's, it's so difficult. It's very central to um, Silicon Valley. Um, I think it's something on the order of 80% of the world's venture capital comes out of Silicon Valley on one stretch of road called Sand Hill Road, which is probably, you know, all the firms are there, but they're you know, they, they need you to have a fairly sizable, scalable business. Um, been spending a lot of time both there and in New York City lately, and realizing that um, investors or you know either enterprise software or kind of consumer technology, they're looking for something with metrics. So really, kind of metrics-driven um, investments. So. You know, as as Rod mentioned, you know, knowing those numbers cold, how much does it cost to acquire a customer? What's the lifetime value of your customers? And if those things work out, then then you actually have a model that can scale very very large. But what we uh, decided at Voices for as long as humanly possible, again, is that um, that we would pursue you know, our, um, acquiring modest amounts of debt. 
uh, paying it off, and then go going and getting another loan. So, you know, again, ten years ago, we started with a fifteen thousand uh, dollar loan, paid it off. The next one was twenty five, paid it off. The next one was fifty, and sometimes we'd even pay these off earlier. But it was in all in, a, in an effort to have that really long view that. We're going to build a track record with this financial institution. So I can go in there and say, look, I've had seven loans with these guys. I've been good on every single one of them. I've never missed a payment. I've got a tremendous track record. And that that's what's going to be uh, a lot more credible um, because they're they're lending you personally the money a lot of times, not, you know. And so that's been, that's been our approach. Uh, rather than the, the hope and the dream of a Kickstarter campaign, you smashed it or venture capital, something like loving your idea and putting several million into it. No, you know, you should be focused on building a real company that maybe at the right time a much larger ent entity can come into play and more of a partnership um, that can help scale up your company. Cool. Awesome. All right. So now we're going to talk a little bit about marketing. Um, so the first question, um, which is pretty general, and I think a lot of small business owners have this question, where are some of the best places to advertise a small business? I think it depends on what you're selling. I mean, if you're, you know, if you're, yeah, I mean, product or service, is it online? Can you accept orders online? You know, um, are you... Are you? Is it local? If you have a physical location, then maybe investing in a great sign outside of your location is going to be very meaningful. The signs aren't cheap; they're like thirty, fifty grand to have a, a nice illuminated sign that's running twenty four seven. You probably will get a lot further with that than uh, than you know, plowing ten thousand dollars on Google AdWords, as an example. So I think the the product and the service uh, matters, and if it's online or inherently offline, those are the decisions that are going to drive ultimately where you spend your money. Um, I tell a I tell a story about we you know at, at Voices.com it's purely an online service where businesses hire voice actors typically that do commercials and YouTube video narrations and so forth. And years ago we ran a uh, a campaign where we emailed or sorry we mailed. Um, these jumbo size kind of postcards, and we sent them to advertising agencies in New York and Los Angeles. And we spent thirty thousand dollars on this campaign. This was our entire like years. It was one whole loan that we got. We <laughs> ridiculously blew it all on this one campaign. And uh, I know everyone's laughing because it was just it was just not. Oh. We had huge you know, <laughs> we go, go go with a big bang, and. Um, what ended up, and they showed, they, they showed us who it was going to go to, and we were really confident and really well designed. Um, and the the call to action was enter, you know, basically they get the postcard, go to our website, fill out this form, and enter to win an iPod. Um, out of the 30,000 people that we ended up uh, messaging, we got two responses. Oh, wow. The cost per lead was $15,000 a lead. <laughs> We totally felt obligated to like you know literally put their name, two people's names in a hat and draw them out and go like ta da this guy won this iPod and we should do it. But the lesson there for for us was we asked our customers to do or our prospects to do way too much. They're getting something physical in the mail and then go over to the computer, type it up, pull up and you know pull up a browser, visit our website, fill up this form. It was way too much. In effect, we were asking them to change channels. So if you are, have an offline business, advertise offline. If you have an online business, then yes, it makes sense to spend money on Google AdWords because you have a means of one click, they're visiting your website, you can capture information or maybe present them with a special offer, get them on an email list or something along those lines. So I think it's mm -hmm. important to match up your offer with the channel where you're ultimately going to be doing business. The, the the thing I want out in the commonality though, and, I, and I'm, I'm not, um, I, I actually do, I have a couple online businesses that sit on our boards, but in this day and age, your business card, your calling card is your website, and I have companies that work with us that are like small fencing companies, high end plastics manufacturers, uh, auto collision. There's there's no common thread between any of these companies, 
The one thing we've seen, and we've seen this at the alternative board in, in five countries, is that that website, it doesn't matter what you do. You don't have to have an online business. It is your, it is your business card. In this day and age, they're going to go and look at your website. Now, if you're not selling anything on your website, that's fine. But it still has to look professional because it, everybody's going to go and take a look. And, and that's where I, one of the best things I've seen taking place is this wake up to search engine optimization, SEO. And I just encourage business owners not to be scared of this sort of thing. And, it's, it, and I'm a very, you know, I, I have nothing to do with SEO, but I've seen one common thread, regardless of the type of business, is a, even a minor investment in that SEO. So to answer the question, you know, where are they advertised as a small business, make sure you've got a decent web page. It doesn't have to be mind-boggling, especially if you're just starting out and you're not a web-based company. And look at search engine optimization. These days, I'll tell you, you can get optimization for 100, 200 bucks on a monthly basis, and it'll it'll blow your mind what takes place, because that's where people are going to go. And then again, if you're dealing in local, the whole buzzword these days is local SEO, and it, people aren't looking at it. And the reality is, we know that uh, everybody's doing searches. The vast majority, the last thing I read, is 75 or 78 percent of searches are done with a mobile device. They're doing it, and they're local. So you need to have that local presentation, and, and SEO companies can do it, and you need to have that calling card uh, first class. And again, we're, it doesn't have anything to do with being an online business, but you have to have that presence. So I, I think that's one of the first places someone should spend a little bit of money, not in contradiction to the great sign and knowing your marketplace. That's I completely agree, but as a basis, you've you got to have that, that, that calling card. Uh, absolutely, Rod. I mean, there, there's there's no excuse nowadays. I mean, you can register a domain name, you can get, build a WordPress, you know, install, hire somebody to install WordPress in five minutes. Literally, it's called the five minute WordPress install. And you know, go to something like Theme Forest where you can buy one of these premium themes that make it look like somebody literally make it look like you spend ten, twenty grand on this high end professional design that you can customize all the content after the fact. So I, I agree. Um, the other thing about the local searches, there was a research report out there. When people are searching for a local business, um, there's three things that they're looking for to have answered immediately on, uh, on your website. Are you open today? Right? So your hours of... Like, who's, who hasn't done this? Like, whether it's the museum or the movie theater, the restaurant. Like, are you open right now? Um, what are your hours of operation, and if there's any kind of pricing, uh, if there's any kind of pricing information? So, though, I mean, if I mean, if you can disclose pricing, great. If there's discounts, wonderful. But just the simplest things that uh, pricing and hours of operation, and where where's your address again? I can't remember how to get there. Those are like the those are the simple, most common things that need, need to be answered for those local businesses. And adding to the online component, so not, not necessarily the local businesses, one thing that's just worked really well for us is test, testing different channels, but then asking all of our paying customers, where did you hear about us? And you can install fancy analytics packages and all of that, but sometimes people will watch a YouTube video. We, we are a test prep company, and we create videos, and they'll watch a YouTube video, and then they'll go to Google and type in our name. And There's no way to track them across the web, but when we ask them and they tell us YouTube, we know we can keep investing in YouTube. Or, um, we found that we got some customers because we do have a sign in our window and they were walking by and then they looked us up online and they told us, I walked by your office and you had a sign up. And just tracking your different advertising channels is, I think, a mistake that a, a lot of early stage business owners make. Uh, they, they assume certain things will work and they don't actually follow up to see our people purchasing for those reasons. I mean, David told a great story of spending all this money and being able to track the two people filled out um, the form. Well, it's great that you knew that and that it's yeah. not going to work again, but um, I think just being able to track is a key piece that every small business owner should sort of put in you know, on day one. You need, it's such a great point. Uh, we had a company that sat on our board for a, a, a quite a while and it was shocked. They did uh, specialized parts for a very particular year of car, such a very specialized business. And their assumption, and they were spending a fortune on all this different magazine advertising and all these other things. And all they simply did was they started asking their customers when they called in, where did you hear about me? And they eventually created a, a little simplistic check mark sheet, so low tech, forget mm -hmm. analytics, 
And they realized that within 60 days, they were 100% incorrect with where they thought they were getting their business from. And they would have made such terrible mistakes. And all they had to do was lit, like just to have a conversation and say, hey, how'd you get a hold of us? And it changes everything. Back to the web page sort of thing. And I, I love what he said, um, the other panelist. It, you, you don't have to get complicated. You don't have to spend a ton of money. You know, just have the basics, have the windows signed, ask people, communicate with your customers. You don't need a massive campaign out there. I'd like to add, if you uh, are doing any kind of uh, software or B2B services, don't overlook partnerships. Those can be very, very powerful. Uh, if you can get listed in an app store, of another a bigger, better known application or software platform, and there are you know, quite a few out there. I mean, there's everything you know from the Google App Store to um, you know Google Play to um, you know Intuit has has their apps ecosystem. Whatever it is, whatever makes sense for your business, make sure you're listed in that and that you're part of it. Also, offering integrations today is really key if you have any kind of software, because again very often there will be some sort of directory that has these kinds of applications uh, listed that one application integrates with. So you want to make sure you integrate and that you're somehow connected with these other apps. I've got a couple things here as well. Um, to, the, to the point about search engine optimization in your website and, and this whole thing of everyone looking on Google uh, and searching out different products and services and looking for uh, businesses. I think the first step, um, even before you ha you put together your website, is go onto Google and look for your business and see what's showing up. And it may be Yelp reviews, it may be City Search. It, you know, there's all these directories and those types of things. And a lot of times when I'm advising people on their business, I go and look. And number one for their business is a Yelp page that has you know that one client that had a bad experience and they have a one star review, and that's the first thing people are seeing. Um, so go and look and see you know what's already showing up and then absolutely as you fix those things you're going to want to have your own website you know obviously to rank ahead of those things as well um, and then another thing you know we've built our all the businesses that I've been involved in have been 100 percent online and primarily online marketing but my father owns a real estate business and when I was home for for vacation you know a couple years ago I guess he got a postcard in the mail from Google a direct mail piece, you know, asking him to advertise using Google AdWords, and I thought, wow, you know, that this this is you know the the you know online marketing monster, and here they are sending a piece of direct mail. Um, so if they're doing it, you know, it's working. So I w you know I wouldn't necessarily discount a lot of the offline things. Another you know two two more points is. One, don't forget about your existing customers. The, uh, uh, this is from a dental friend of mine who asked me for marketing help, and I said, well, you know, how many customers do you have on your books, and what percentage of those customers are still cu clients? And it was something like 40%, and after doing a little research, apparently that's about the number for dentists. So 60% of the people that knew about his business don't use him anymore, and there was no marketing plan in place for trying to reactivate those existing clients and the other thing is I said well where are you getting your clients now and he did do a good job of tracking and speaking to the offline thing and this was absolutely shocking to me but flyers he had a guy that would stand out stand outside and hand out flyers and that was the number one place that he was bringing in business to his very successful uh, dental practice so just a few few other bits there Awesome. All right. Well, we have about five minutes left, so there is one more question that I do want to get to. Rod, you had kind of touched on this a little bit um, as far as mobile searching. How important is it to have a mobile-friendly site for a small business? It's super important, especially if you're a restaurant or somewhere where people are going to stop in and see you. Um, you know, I think probably the majority of the traffic that's going to result in a sale for you is going to be coming from a mobile device. So if people can't access your site from a mobile device that's a big problem and the, the, this used to be a, a difficult thing to do but now you know there's response most website builders like Weebly and Wix and site builders like that as well as the WordPress themes that Dave was mentioning are, are, are built responsive so they'll work you know if you choose a responsive a builder or, or WordPress theme they'll they'll actually um, adjust to the mobile phone automatically yeah I think in this day and age again uh, 
I, I know enough about it to, to know I don't know enough. <laughs> but um, on the mobile site, it's just mandatory. It's just a check mark that has to be there. It's not technically challenging anymore. Uh, back to the web page, the business card. You know, I've had business owners who are so proud of their card. They want to give me their card. They want to give me this. And they don't have the website on it. And I'm saying, you know, it's not about being tech. I don't care what it is, how you do it. You have to be web friendly. You have to have a decent web page. You have to be mobile friendly. So it's absolutely critical. And I and I know virtually it, it's effortless these days. If you have a challenge, go you know, go Google a, a, a local company that'll do that for you, and they're going to get an answer in about 30 seconds and have a dozen people that want to do it for you. Very easy to do. The key word I think that. Um, entrepreneurs out there should be looking for is responsive web design. That's what you want to be looking for. A theme or some type of you know on your website that is responsive. Um, and uh, you know, as David mentioned that that's uh, um, you know basically it allows kind of the, the contents of your website to have one version of it that dynamically adjusts to the screen size and resolution. So whether somebody's looking on a Galaxy Tab, an iPad, iPhone, iPad, whatever it is, or even your full desktop, it's the same content and same experience across all the devices. One thing that you'll probably see in search results, if somebody just wants to do a Google search right now on their smartphone, you'll see that Google actually adds, adds a little prefix that says mobile site. So right away, they're trying to tell users that this is mobile, it's worth clicking through, Google can tell, um, and, and it's worth looking through that you're not having to do that um, awful pinch and view and trying to figure out what the land is on the smartphone. They're telling the searcher, even before they visit your site, if it's going to be worthwhile. And last thing on that, there is a lot of news recently in all of the Google uh, updates, speaking of search engine authorization, like the last, again, last decade, they've never pre-announced an update. and. Um, there's one that's upcoming, I believe it's this next month or the one after, where they're going to heavily reward those sites that are mobile optimized. So I think there is such a, there's so much data indicating, and even you know, the 800 pound gorilla, saying that you have to have not only a website, but a mobile optimized website, and they're going to give preferential treatment for it. So you can, you can do your own, um, those that are interested, do your own research on that, but it's the first time they've ever pre-announced um, a change to the algorithm that's going to it's going to affect a lot of people for better or for worse. Just make sure you're on the right side of that. Well said. All right. Well, um, that is about all the time we have for today. I want to give a big thank you to all of our panelists. You all gave us some really great insights today, so we appreciate you giving us an hour of your time to just let our audience know some of these great information. Um, we do have the link underneath this window for the survey, so if you could just click that purple button, um, you'll just be taken to a short survey, just a couple questions, let us know what you thought, give us some feedback for our future fireside chats. Um, and if you did RSVP with us and gave us your email address, you will be getting a summary of this fireside chat with everything that we said and everything that went on emailed to you in the coming weeks, so you can keep an eye out for that. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Nice meeting you all. Take nice care. meeting you.